lay out the vision of reality that is implicit or that is coming to expression in the church's doctrine of God and of Christ. Um, so that's their focus. So, but, but what I want to, to do this, this, this morning is to finish our flight, our flyover of the ecumenical councils, and then we'll land and we'll go back. And I'd like to go through, uh, especially the fourth century, the first two ecumenical councils of the fourth century, because that really is a critical century uh, when all of the, uh, the principles of the church's, uh, let's call it the philosophical theology, uh, were laid down. Um, in fact, uh, you know, I shared with you that I, that I did my thesis on Leontius of Jerusalem in the 6th century. He was connected with the 5th Ecumenical Council. I chose that century and I chose Leontius because I felt that he gave expression to the um, Eastern, the Greek uh, understanding or the Greek Christological confession. And that that century and that, and that, that particular period in the 5th century, um, let me get, no, 6th century, because this was in the 500s, um, marked the point where the, the, the crossroads between East and West began to diverge. Uh, they diverge at the, at the point of Christological confession and, you know, what's inside the Christological confession. Uh, however, when I came out of the thesis, you know, and I was done, my intention was to continue looking into the 6th century and, and, and beyond, but I found myself actually going back. And um, um, I did quite a bit of work on St. Gregory the Theologian uh, in the 4th century, somewhat to my surprise. Um, and I felt that in St. Gregory of the, the Theologian, St. Gregory of Nunzianzas, I felt that he solved the Christological problem. And he gave it articulation, he gave it expression, um, he brought it into sharp focus, he nailed it. But it took the church like three, four hundred years to catch up with St. Gregory. Um, so, they, and so, so as I say, there, there's so much going on in the fourth century that, uh, and, and I, we'll spend some time in there because, and in, in an effort to get, to, to lay down, to set out for us the, you know, the vision of reality, as I'm calling it. There's, there's, there's many things to, 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 uh, to consider there. Okay, so we've already done the Council of, of Nicaea. This is against Arianism, who taught that the Lord Jesus was the first of God's creatures. He could not, uh, he, could, he did not, he, he, he could not um, see God as Trinity. He was basically a Judaizer, um, so that on the line between the created and the uncreated, only the Father is on the line of the uncreated. The Son is the first of all creatures, and then through the Son, he, well this is actually another Arian, not Arius himself, although who knows what Arius taught about the Holy Spirit, I, don't, I haven't really read much about that. But through the Son, he created the Holy Spirit. So the Father was the only uncreated being, but he was truly, he was the only one truly God. This is basically, Jonathan, you recognize it like little Platonism? You know, basically the sun is the demiurge. You know, it's, it's just another, it's, it, it turns the church into another uh, school of philosophy. So the, the second council was 381 in Constantinople. Uh, this was Nicaea 1. This was Constantinople 1. Um, there are no records for this council. So what we know of the council is, is gleaned from um, Father's reports of what happened. There were no minutes that we can, that are, that, that are um, extant from, from this council. This council established against the Nematamaki or whatever, Nematamaki, uh, um, uh, that's not right, I spelled it, misspelled it, the Numa. Numa Mataki, whatever. The, the, the fighters against the Holy Spirit. 
as the Aryans uh, sought to demonstrate that the sun was the uh, was the first creature, uh, the Numatamaki, whatever, how we pronounce it, um, did the same with the Holy Spirit, that, that the Holy Spirit also was a creature. So that uh, the Second Ecumenical Council affirmed that both the Son and, well, excuse me, the, first, the, the Second Ecumenical Council, after the First Ecumenical Council had brought the Son up here, the Second Ecumenical Council did the same with the Holy Spirit. So now you have a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the problem is, the question is, um, how is it that we don't have three gods? How is it that there's only one God? How are we going to understand essence, being? How are we going to understand the particular? So you can see, if you're, you know, those of you who have studied philosophy at all, you can see how the doctrine of the Trinity is the church's answer to the first philosophical problem. The first problem that, you might say, the problem that uh, broke the waters of mythology and gave birth to philosophy. The problem of the one and the many. How to account for the unity of the cosmos in the view of all the particular varieties of the cosmos. How are they all held together? And when you, when you look at the, all the different particulars, the many, uh, if you can look what's inside of them, as it were, to see what makes them to be what they are, and you look inside of that to see what makes it to be what it is, how do you, so that there are, if, you, if you keep going, you'll come into basically a monism, where everything is basically the, is one and the same. Yes, Erica. Our questions, welcome. Absolutely. Okay. This is such an important question. Um, my question is, and maybe it's not really answerable, but since it's so important, why didn't Jesus spend more time explaining to his disciples the whole Trinity thing? Well, but you know, he refers to his Father, and he refers to his Holy Spirit. But we're in a different world when we're, when we're in the Bible, are we not? We're in the world of, how would you say, faith? The world of intimate union with God? Um, the issue there is salvation, not philosophical structure of reality. Not that the two are unrelated, they are. Mm -hmm. They are. Um, I reflect, the, the answer to that question, Erica, is somewhat involved. And I, I anticipate that we're going to be addressing that question throughout. Um, perhaps for now, uh, because there's, a, there's some other um, uh, prior understandings that we need to put into place before we can stand on a firm foundation to address that question. Um, it's a good question. It's a, it's a fun question. Um, for now, uh, you remember, uh, the whole, the, that the Son, that, that the Lord said to his disciples, when, my, when, my, when the Spirit comes, he will lead you into all truth. So there was the understanding that he, he wasn't telling them the whole truth. Um, I think the fathers would, would, would tell us the reason he didn't was because they couldn't handle it. It was too much. So, you know, the, the, the Spirit will, bring, will lead you into all truth. So, um, this is what's playing out, you might say, in these 700, this is how long it took the church to, to come to grips with the mystery of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Um, so that's one thing, uh, just off the, call, off the top. A second thing might be from St. Macarius, um, one of his sermons, I think we read it at uh, one of the catechetical classes, uh, maybe the time before last. Remember where he says, it, it talks about man's free will that um, if salvation were easy, it's not easy because of our sin. So basically it's not easy because we're having to fight ourselves to get to the kingdom of heaven. But he says, if free will were not in play, it's not so much if it weren't so easy, but rather if free will were not in play, if it were not being honored, then where would be the, where would be the, then you would just be a robot. So I'm thinking that the um, problem of the Trinity and of Christ, as it is presented to us in the Bible, 
It's in the Bible. But we have to deal with it. We have to figure it out, if you will. And there's a reason why we have to figure it out. But if, uh, if I'm thinking that, that this is the play, this is how the, the free, our free will is playing itself out. The answers are not given. It's not easy. We have to fight for the answer. So now the question becomes, okay, so what's going to be the basis of your fight? On what basis are you going to fight? On what basis are you going to even approach the question? Uh, which, um, which, gets, which, which is in itself a fascinating problem because it, it points out that you know, we, can, we can go over the seven ecumenical councils and we can lay out what the theme was for each council. But then when we go back and we start assessing uh, what happened and, and, and the meaning of the, of the, of the uh, creed and, and the definitions of faith, that in itself is going to be a controversy. Because what I've learned, and I've seen with my eyes, <laughs> your assessment of the Christology of the ecumenical councils and the doctrine of the Trinity is itself conditioned by your Christological confession. You understand? So it's not cut and dried. It's all part it's of this. It's meant for us to struggle. To yourself. struggle. Yes, your free will. You know, to give honor to your free will. Um, um, Jonathan. Well, it, it, the way you phrased that question, it struck me the Matthew passage, the exchange between Jesus and Peter. We see okay. exactly that going on where Jesus does give Peter more about who he is. What, he gives, what do you mean? What do you mean? He gives more when about He says, uh, I will. Verse that he'll go, he'll go oh, and suffer and die. Oh, yes. And Peter is like, no, that's not going to Oh, happen. yeah. And he rebukes him. It's sort of this uh, Jesus only mm. gives it, it seems like, so much of what his disciples can handle. And even the little even bit little that bit he does they give, they, they even can't quite handle that. And, yeah. and it reminds me, too, you know, everybody thinks he's going to just take over for John. Yes. yes. And that seems like another thing of, yeah. I'm thinking of that, that quote, and I don't know who this is. Um, but like we live life forwards, but we understand it backwards. Mm. And it's sort of this, it takes this sort of encounter for us to then figure out, you know, like to open up new possibilities of understanding things. Um, Thank you. That, that's, that's, that's a very good point for the camera. <laughs> what you just said was that uh, we see this, this, this uh, being played out in the road to Caesarea Philippi, Matthew 16, where um, the Lord... Well, the Father reveals to Peter, remember, the Father reveals to Peter who Jesus is. Uh, Jesus doesn't force it on him. And I have suggested that the reason the Father was able to reveal it to Peter was because Peter had faith. He had love for Christ. And love is the, is the basis of knowledge. So he, had, he, he believed. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, well, now it's reminding me that you get even more development of who Christ was in Acts after Jesus is gone. Yes. And, they're, and, they're, and now they're, it's, they're, they've witnessed what's happening and they're going back to Scripture. And now in yes. the law, yes. it's being revealed as they figure more yes. through these questions. You know so, what? You'll, yeah. you'll even see that in the four Gospels. Mm -hmm. what, what, what order do they go in? I think Mark is first, and then Matthew, Luke, and then John. So John is written in like the 90s? Even early 2nd century, I think. So Could saying. be. Yeah. So between Mark and John, you can see already a development of theological understanding. John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's theology. That's deep theology. So it took the church a while for this, it took this flower a while to, to blossom in the mind of the church. Um, yeah, so... Okay, so, okay, so um, yeah, where were we? That's all fine, that's fine, I don't mind, that's fine. Um, this was very good, very good. Um, so, okay, so I guess we'll just return to the, to the, uh, uh, the narrative for this morning. Um, so at the Council of Constantinople, um, where the Holy Spirit is affirmed to be on the uncreated side, so we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have a trinity, Okay, now we have the problem of the one and the many. Um, but we have to, you know, I think this might also address your question, Erica. Uh, how are we going to solve that problem? Or the riddle of the one and the many? 
Um, well, it so happens that between Nicaea and Constantinople, among the many figures that step onto the stage, there's one figure in particular who steps on the stage and who really uh, speeds things up. And I think that, I think it was St. Gregory's the, uh, um, uh, uh, arguments with Apollinaris that sharpened the, the vision of the church in the person of St. Gregory. I think it was in his argument against Apollinaris said that St. Gregory uh, nailed the, he hit the nail on the head, he, he hit the nub of the Christological riddle, we'll say, the Christological riddle, and he solved it. And that, as I say, that person was Apollinaris. Apollinaris comes, up, comes forward, um, he is also trying to, he's, he's trying to account for the unity of Christ. So he's introducing now into the mix um, a Christological issue, a specifically Christological issue that has to do specifically with Christology, with Christ. Having said that, I want to point out that even the doctrine of the Trinity that is being hammered out in the first and second ecumenical councils is the doctrine of the Trinity. But can you see how the doctrine of the Trinity is being um, uh, laid out, it's being developed or formulated, let's say, on the basis of, the Christo of your Christological confession. Do you say that Christ, the Son of God, is uncreated or created? That's the basis for the whole, doc the whole argument over the Trinity, the co controversy over the Trinity. So even the doctrine of the Trinity is Christological in that sense. It starts with Christ. But now Apollinarius comes on and now he, folk he brings the attention, as it were, not so much on the Trinity, but on Christ himself. We can see in Holy Scripture that he's fully man, for he acts like a man. He has the appearance of a man. He was born of a woman. Okay, that woman was a virgin. That's not quite normal. Um, but he's fully human, it appears, it appears. But he also acts like God. So the issue is, how is this man a single being? How is he, how is he just, how is he one person? So, uh, and, and how can you account for his being one person but also account for him apparently having or existing in two natures, human and divine. So Apollinaris' solution is to basically an Arian solution. He, he presents the same image of Christ as Arius did, but with this difference. That whereas for Arius, uh, Jesus, the Logos, was created for Apollinaris, the Logos was uncreated, and it works like this. So you have the human composite, which is mind, soul, and body. So what Apollinaris did was he had the Logos in the place of the mind. So the divine Logos just wraps himself, he clothes himself with the soul and the body, and now here you have it. He has the appearance of a man. He is a man. I like Apollinaris, to be honest. I did a paper on Apollinaris. I was kind of taken by him. His philosophy, his, his, his Christology is very coherent. It has a certain seductive quality about it. But can you see the problem? Remember we said at the, uh, at the beginning of last Sunday's, last Sunday's class that there are two basic heresies. There's adoptionism. If Jesus is a man who was adopted by God, as it were, and so his distinct, he's distinct from other men only in the fact that he has a very special relationship with the Father that other men don't have. And then there's docetism, in which the Lord, in which the Logos, or the Word of God, the Son of God, um, only looks like a man, but he's not really a man. He just has the appearance of a man. So can you? So which of these two heresies would you see this Apollinarianism to be? Docetism, yes. <clears throat> Can you say that this is a real human nature? Is he really man if he doesn't have a mind? No. no. So is there an incarnation? Not really. There's no incarnation. Which actually directs us to one of the criteria 
that must be satisfied in any orthodox Christology, already laid down actually by the Apostle John, right, in the first epistle. Beloved, test the spirits. If, if any, any spirit that denies that Jesus is the Christ come in the flesh is not of God. So the affirmation of the incarnation that Christ, God, whoever he is relative to the Father, in terms of, philosoph in terms of essence, uh, if, if he has if he confessed to be uh, not in the flesh, then that is not from God. Well, this is clearly a denial of the incarnation. So Apollinaris was also condemned at the Second Ecumenical Council, and it was affirmed that Jesus the Christ is the Son of God of one essence with the Father, but that he is clothed with mind, body, and soul, the full human nature, the whole human nature. But can you see, maybe by way of anticipation, can you see where the Christological problem is? Can you see where it is? The problem is, how can God the Son, who is of one essence with the Father, become fully man without being another person? Because that was the other, that was actually what Apollinaris was, was fighting against. Uh, this uh, Christology that comes mostly from Antioch and environs that uh, presented Jesus as a separate subject or as his own subject, independent uh, or not separate from, distinguishable from the subject of God the Son. This was represented primarily like Theodore of Tarsus, uh, Theodore of Mopsuestia, um, whose Christology showed in, in an effort to maintain the full integrity of Christ's human nature, ended up pretty much presenting Christ as two persons, a human person, Jesus, and the divine person, the divine Logos. Yes, Eric? So is it okay to say he has two natures? Yes. Okay, so two natures, uh -huh. and it's also okay to say he clothed himself in the flesh. He, or to be more, uh, more, uh, more full, he clothed himself in our human nature. But now the issue is, what constitutes human nature? And this is the issue with, this was an issue with the Polaris and, and St. Gregory. St. Gregory would argue the mind is the most essential part of our nature. Because it's the, it's the ruler, it's the governor. You know? So if he does not assume a human mind, there's no real human. He's just a, he's a, he's a monster. He's a freak. Um, so, but, uh, but um, yeah, so if, in, so in the, uh, in this uh, other Christology, you can call it the Antiochian tendency, because uh, this is where Antiochian, Christology, Antiochian theology inclines toward, in an effort to maintain the full integrity of the human nature, it, 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 it has a mind, a soul, and a body for, in Jesus. But basically, you have Jesus, who is the human nature, mind, body, soul, and you have the Logos, who is the divine nature. So these are, are united in the word in Greek is the word for mask. In Latin, the word is person. This is where it gets interesting. Person in Latin, per sona, a sounding through. Per, through, sona, the sound. So, a mask is what the actors would wear on stage. As they would change parts, they would put on a different mask. So, that's how this Antiochian Christology tended to view Christ. Christ is the person. Christ is the persona. He's the prosopon in the Greek which means the same thing, pro, sopon, sounding through. Um, he's the mask that, you might say, is over the visible face of Jesus, I don't know how you, would, how you would say it, but he's the mask that, that in which be, behind which you find Jesus and the Logos. Now, what's the wrong with that? That seems to take away the reality of the person. The reality of person. Well, the, yeah, the person becomes this impersonal, ontic shell. You know, that's all it is. 
That's one problem with it. But they did, that problem didn't seem to bother uh, so many in the, in the early church, in the 4th, 5th, 6th century even. There's an, which, if, if you were to label this or to align this up with one of these two, where would you put it? Docetism. Why? Let's try adoptionism. Okay. <laughs> Do you see why it would be adoptionism? It yes, it's, it's Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. Like an Jesus is, is the man. He's the man, but he's his own subject. But he's just in a very, very tight relationship with the Lord, the Word of God. So a very, in fact, uh, the Antiochians would call it a union uh, of goodwill. It was by the goodwill of the, of the Father that uh, the Logos, the Son of God, uh, joins himself to the man Jesus, to the fetus that is in the virgin's womb. He joins himself to the fetus, but the one who's born is not the Logos, it's Jesus. The one who dies on the cross is not the Logos, it's, the, it's, it's Jesus. Now, in that sense, you could say it's kind of docetic. So it appears that the Logos, you might say, is suffering. It appears that the Logos is being born, but he's not. So then let me ask you this the question then. Is this a real incarnation? No. No, it is not. The Logos is not becoming flesh. He's just attaching to himself a human nature. So you have two. So it raises the question in my mind. So when you pray to Christ, who are you praying to? Are you praying to Jesus and he goes to the Logos? Are you going to the Logos? I mean, it just, it's, it's confusing. So, all of this was, with all of this now, this whole, this whole, uh, this was the introduction to the Christological issue. Um, injected into the Trinitarian um, controversies. So it's interesting that the Trinitarian controversies were settled relatively quickly, relatively quickly. So at Constantinople, they decide that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all on the same side of the uncreated mind, all uncreated. Okay, now it does raise the question, it raises the question, and, and it's still with us. How are the persons of the Trinity connected to one another? How are they related to one another ontologically uh, without being three gods? It's still an issue with us. I would say in Christendom. And I can even find, even now, that the Trinitarian theology, generally speaking, of the Latin West, is, has a different flavor from the Trinitarian theology of the Greek East. And so it's still with us. But injected into this, it's like, it's like this was, um, it was, I guess they decided, you could say they decided that this was, this was enough. We, uh, we, we've done the Trinity as best we can, so we'll, we'll go on to other things now. And so they go on to, so now Christology takes the stage. Jesus Christ, who is he relative to the Father? What is he relative to the Father? Who is he relative to his mother? What is he relative to his mother? One person. What is the one person? What do we mean by one person? Do we, you know, is it the prosopon? Is it the persona? Because it, so that, that, that's the whole thing. So, one more issue perhaps to, to, to get before us here. At the Second Ecumenical Council, the way, that they, the way that they finally came to formulate the doctrine of the Trinity was to take two words that were pretty much synonymous um, in the uh, philosophical language of, of the classical world. Of, Greek, of, of Hellenism, the, the words essence, which, is, which was uh, it, it basically means what it is. It is what it is. What it is. That's what it is. The essence is what it is. So our essence would be human. That's what we all are. And then there's the apostasis, which also means something that's essential, substantive. It, it can be a synonym for essence, you know, what everything is, but it can also be used to refer to each particular in order to say that, that you're not a mirage, you're, you're essential, you know, you're apostatic, 
You're in hypostasis. So the fathers took these two words, in particular, St. Athanasius, St. Basil of Caesarea, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Gregory the theologian. And they, if you will, they baptized these words, they put them to death, and then they raised them up with new meaning, in which essence now refers to what's common between the, the particulars. And the hypostasis refers to the particulars. Now, that seems like a, why did it take them so long to, to make that distinction? But um, it's, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge, uh, it's hugely significant. Because now the hypostasis, which no longer is a synonymous with essence as it was before, now the hypostasis refers specifically to the, to the particular. And here's the difference, here's what makes it so, so significant. The hypostasis is made up from two words, hypo, which means underneath, stasis, which means standing, or if you're going to talk philosophically, it means existently. So that which is underneath, that which exists underneath. Can you see how hypostasis is virtually the opposite of prosopon, the persona? The hypostasis is underneath, the persona, the person, is what's on the outside, what you see. So, if you're going to identify each particular as a hypostasis, you're not referring to the persona, the prosopon, you're referring to, well, for, for now, you're referring to what's absolutely underneath that person. What makes that person to be himself and not someone else. That's the hypostasis. But can you see that that also kind of renews the whole Trinitarian problem? You have three hypostases. Okay, they all have the same essence, but it's just like you and me. You have the same essence, but each one of us is a hypostasis. We say that we have however many people here, however many persons here. How is it that we're not saying that we have, that we don't have three gods, we have three hypostases. So the mind has still not been completely sanctified in the waters of the Bible. It's not been completely sanctified. It's still wanting to think philosophically, which is to think in, way, in the way of the myth, and not to think in the way of biblical theology. Did you understand that, Jonathan? You think? Uh, I, mean, I mean something very specific with that. Um, so, the mind has not yet been sanctified. It's still trying to understand. It's, it, we're still seeing the mind trying to plumb the depths of biblical theology and trying to understand it. And in this effort to plumb the depths of biblical theology and to understand the revelation of God in Christ, God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus as the Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, uh, we're still trying to understand that, and, and it's, it is such a deep, um, you know, uh, view, such a deep uh, mystery that as we're making the descent, trying to look into it, it's very easy not to slip away over here into philosophy, into the myth, and to start talking and thinking like all the other philosophers. So the real danger that the church is fighting here is how to remain biblical and not become just another school of philosophy. <clears throat> so now we have the Christological issue. But I'm, okay, I was, gonna, I was gonna bring this to a head. Um, with all of us now, I don't know, maybe this is too much to absorb in, in 10 minutes. But with all of this, might you be able to see where the Christological problem lies? What's confusing the issue? Look what Apollinaris did. Replace the mind with the logos in order to, be, in order to get one Christ. One hypostasis, one person, one nature, one essence. That was his, those were, that was his language. Theodore Mopsuestius, for, for example, wishing to maintain the full integrity of Christ's human nature as Jesus with a body, soul, and a mind. 
but he ends up basically with two subjects united in this persona, this ontic shell of the Christ. Can you see the Christological problem starting to present itself? Can you, lo can you even locate where the Christological problem lies? Just from this? No. Would it not be in the mind? No. So the way that Apollinaire solves the Christological problem is he replaces the mind with the logos. But that means that we no longer have an integral human nature. Theodore Mopsuestia seeks to solve the problem of an integral human nature by keeping the mind in there, but now he has basically two subjects. So the problem is the mind. How are we to understand the mind? How are we to understand consciousness? You know? Is, 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 the, is the person the hypostasis, who you are, what you are, is it centered in your mind? Is your mind yourself? Is your mind yourself? Or so is the is the mind or is the mind an, a part of the nature? Didn't that raise the question, okay, then how do we understand a person? Now, okay, this is a philosophical problem. But can you see how the how the church is not seeking to solve the, philosoph the philosophical problem with philosophy. <coughs> There's something that's at stake for the church that philosophy doesn't answer. What's at stake? The salvation of the human being. The whole being. St. Gregory would say to Apollinaris, what is not assumed by the Logos is not saved. So if he does not assume the human mind, then the human mind is not saved. And where are you? Goodness, where, you know, where is the origin of all of your desires or your, your bad habits? Uh, you know, isn't it in the mind? That means you're lost. Okay, but then how does Christ assume the human mind and not become a human person? Another human subject. If he were to become a human person, there would be, he, you know, it would be the, it'd be the divine person of the Logos uh, changing his identity. I mean, how can that be? So there's the Christological problem, if you will. And this is what now, it, and, and as I say, I think St. Gregory of, N of Nunziosis was the, really the only one to see it, as far as, this is what I think, he was the only one to see it in the fourth century. But this, but this is what's playing out under, this is what's, what's troubling all the waters. This is, the, this is, the, uh, this is the, el the elephant in the room. You know, this is what's uh, playing out underneath all the controversies now that will unfold over the next few centuries. And it will take the church a while to reach the, the insight of St. Gregory of the, of the Theologian. It will take the church until um, the Council of Chalcedon, the Council of Chalcedon, um, Constantinople II in 553, the Fifth Ecumenical Council, to see it. But even then, there will not be unanimous agreement. And even now, there is not unanimous agreement. Because, how, as I said, how you understand the, Christolo the Christology that was formulated by the Ecumenical Councils is itself governed by your Christological confession. So if your if uh, um, uh, uh, tendency, your preference, is for the Antiochian type of Christology, uh, you will view the Christology of the Ecumenical Councils differently than, let's say, a St. Gregory of Nazianzus. But even St. Gregory, how you assess St. Gregory of Nazianzus is, is controversial. Was he, was he affirming St. Theodore of Mopsuestia? Not, not saying, he was not a saint. Was he affirming St. Theodore of Mopsuestia when he affirmed against Apollinarius that the Lord had a full human mind? There are those scholars even today who think, who think that St. That Gregory of Nunzianzus was an Antiochian in his Christology. I don't think that. So this is fraught with fun. <laughs> it's fun. It, it, it's intriguing. It's provocative. It's, it's fascinating. But what's happening is that the church is slowly um, baptizing the mind. The church is slowly putting the mind's philosophical categories 
to death. These philosophical categories of the mind that came from the myth, putting all that to death, and then raising up the mind into, if you will, the philosophy of biblical theology. And so we have now a completely different, a completely different, like I like to say, we now have something completely different. But it's your Christological confession that will either keep the door shut so that you can't see into the tomb, or that will open the, the door, that will roll the stone away so that you can see into the tomb. It's still not cut and dried, even today. I remember doing my paper on the Entrance of Jerusalem, reading Karl Rahner, um, you know, the, the, the eminent 20th century Catholic theologian, who was still struggling over how Christ could be just one divine person, not a, not a human person, but a divine person, and not be fully human. I remember, you know, great, uh, um, um, Jürgen Moltmann, his book, what was it, The Crucified God, he, he, that was written in the 20th century. He's still struggling with how can this Jesus be God the Son and die on the cross and, not be, and, and, and still be human? How can, he have, how can he be God the Son with a full human nature and, 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 and not have a human, not be a human person but a divine person and still be fully human? So it's, it's still there. So, <laughs> darn it. Um, so we go from here real quick. We go to the fourth, the third ecumenical council in Ephesus, um, and the the, count, the 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 issue here will be the Virgin Mary. Now, is can we call her Theotokos, or do we call her Christotokos, as Nestorius would want to say? So I guess we'll have to wait till next Sunday to to look into that. But for now, I ask you to consider: okay, to call the Virgin Mary Theotokos, Mother of God, is that um, is that just Mariology, or is it Christology? Well, I'll tell you, it's Christology. So you be thinking this next week, how is it that to confess the Virgin Mary as Theotokos, Mother of God, how is that Christological? It's not about Mary, it's about her son. How? Okay, well, we need to get up there if I'm going to keep my promise to get up there by 9.45. Brad, you had a question? Well, I might have to wait and make too long. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. But I mean, I can ask anyway. Ask it. You can be thinking about it. Okay. If we're in a place, and we're humans, so we're not in that place. Okay. If we have the potential or the possibility to, of Christ revealing himself to us, okay. that revelation is beyond all of the all of the conversations. Okay. Because Christ exists in the way okay. he and the Trinity does. Yes. It would be re when he reveals himself to us, it has nothing to do with all the conversations because it's Christ revealing himself to us. And where as humans as Christians we bring ourselves to that place where Christ reveals himself to us and, and we don't like have this revelation or vision or revelation right. of Christ right. and then have to compare it to the councils. Well this is match with us. Because Christ is, is reality that reveals himself true reality. Okay. But of course, all this stuff is, 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 is important to me. I mean, it's, it's, it's well, but we need valuable. It seems, it seems to me need, seems that we need to ask why is it important? How is it important? Right, 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 right. Let me and say where to you, does it happen? Where is the vision? Where let, me it say, let me say this, and you think about this and see if it addresses your question. Christ fills all things. He's all things, filling all things. So he's not just out there transcendent. He's also here eminent. He's, he's, this, he's this mystery. And St. Maximus would say that even the mystery of the... Even when Christ revealed himself in the flesh, he still did not reveal the whole mystery of the Incarnation. So we receive in our soul the full... As, let's say, like it says in the, in the, in the trope for uh, Transfiguration, we receive, the, we receive the revelation as far as we can bear it. But what we receive is the, is the full deal. But only as far as we can bear it. But the mystery overflows. So we're trying, we're trying to get the mystery uh, articulated, defined as best we can, so that we know what way to go. Because we want to be saved. So in a sense, we do have to test that. Absolutely. Yeah, so. But we're lucky because we had all these bishops in the 4th century who were articulating it for us. But as I said, even then, it's controversial. Do you go with those bishops or do you go with other bishops? And it's, 
is still not cut and dried. 